Hello, my name is Caroline Desaire, and I am a senior, majoring in Peace Studies and minoring in French and History. I am currently working as a student assistant at Interculture and International Student Services, where we work to create a safe environment to support international students and offer many programs throughout the academic year to help promote diverse cultures on campus. I would like to take a moment to mention these week's, this week's sponsors, Academic Affairs, CSB Campus Ministry, CSB Sustainability Office, CSB SJU Libraries, the McCarthy Center, Fine Arts Programming, Intercultural International Student Services, Joint Events Council, Coach Chair in Catholic Thought and Culture, the Math Department, PRISM, Reflection Action Dialogue, St. John's University School of Theology, and SJU Theology and TAP. I also encourage you to attend other events that are happening the rest of the week and to complete evaluations that will be going out next week by email. Lastly, it will be my privilege to welcome Dr. Christy Seiver, Associate Professor in Political Science. Her presentation will raise attention to MLK's role in supporting post-colonial and self-determination movements around the world. Also, there are notepads um, in the room and will it be passed around in case you want the electronic version of the PowerPoint because there's hyperlinks and if you want to directly click on those links, um, all you have to do is just write your name and email and it will be sent out to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm really excited about this talk today. Um, my interest in this area started last year actually when as part of the MLK teach-in, I hosted a movie showing uh, from Selma to Soweto, which is about the Congressional Black Caucus and the role of Congress in overturning President Reagan's opposition to putting economic sanctions on South Africa as a means to end the apartheid regime. And in researching that, I discovered uh, kind of the, the, the mutually beneficial relationship between Martin Luther King and post-colonial movements worldwide. So this year, when it came time to kind of look into doing the teach-in, I decided to, to take on this new topic. Now, I want to be honest. Um, this isn't necessarily my uh, MLK and, and the history of post-colonialism aren't necessarily my areas of expertise. But the reason that I thought it was important to kind of bring this issue to your attention is because it's an area where it's very important for us as political scientists and international relations theorists to kind of bring forth these parts of history that have been muted and excluded from our dominant narratives in international relations. So this is something that I've been really committed to do in my teaching, and so I'm excited to share with you what I've learned today. That's why I, I, I want to kind of treat this as, as shared research. Um, so I, print, I have handouts of all of the slides. Those of you who are in my class have electronic copies of those slides in Canvas. But I want to share those slides because I, I'm, if you're interested in this topic and, and interested in pursuing it further, um, I don't see any need for you to kind of redo some of the preliminary research I've done. So I'm really happy to share that with you. So I want to start today by understanding the history of the slave trade and colonialism. And this is actually a pretty remarkable um, infographic that was done, it was posted on Slate. And it shows, it's gonna show over two minutes, and I'll restart it here. Um, it's going to show, let me pause it for a second. So it's going to show, you see all these little dots. And actually, if you go and click on the link yourself and kind of watch it, it takes about two minutes. But what you see is the slave trade moving from parts of Africa to both North America and South America. And so in actuality, the slave trade in the United States was relatively minimal compared to the slave trade in Latin America. And if you're interested in this topic, uh, Professor Dos Santos in our department is proposing to do a race, gender, and culture class in Brazil. Um, that's something you can look forward to in the future. But there certainly was a tremendous amount of slave trade heading towards the United States and North America. Um, and it's just kind of haunting. So these dots are each ships. 
And the size of the dot corresponds to the number of slaves that were on that ship. So you see there are some dots that are bigger, some dots that are smaller. And you see here, even in 1785, we still have a lot of dots um, making that journey from Africa to North America and South America. And one thing I wanna highlight, this is something that you know if you've been listening to PRI's The World, Virginia is in the process of preparing to commemorate the 400 year um, anniversary of the first slave arrival in Virginia in 1619 at Jamestown. Um, and so this is kind of an important to think about uh, the legacy of our country in relationship to slavery. And that data came from the Transatlantic Slave Database, which is uh, on your hyperlink there. Um, in concert with the slave trade that was obviously very active going from Africa to North America, South America, and Europe, there was also um, a conference. So there was a, a large degree of colonialism by European states that was coming down to Africa and claiming different parts of this territory. Um, initially, when this competition was happening, you know, states were kind of not necessarily bumping into each other. They were taking different parts of Africa that they thought were beneficial. But eventually, it did start to kind of become a problem where states thought, oh, we're, we're kind of competing with each other and we don't necessarily want to go to war. And so this political cartoon kind of talks, is, is a representation of the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, where Europe kind of formed carved up Africa and you probably heard before in classes that the continent of Africa the states that are there the boundaries the political boundaries that are there were not necessarily drawn along tribal lines or ethnic lines or represent anything that had anything to do with the indigenous people living there but it had a lot to do with latitude and longitude and what was what was convenient for European powers and so this hyperlink will take you to a short video that will tell you more about the Berlin conference um, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit, you saw that, that um, uh, the, eventually the slave trade did end, um, and it's important to think about kind of how that happened, um, in, in, in there's some interesting kind of history that goes along with this. So in 1807, Britain passed the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act. So this did not ban slavery in Britain, it in fact only banned, it, it in fact only banned the trade. And there was this rising abolitionist movement in Britain, and this was kind of the limited, the limited achievement they could make at the time. Um, there was still a lot of perception of Africa as kind of uncivilized and in need of development, um, and the, the notion of the white man's burden was still very strong, even amongst abolitionists. Um, they thought, you know, it wasn't necessarily fair to put these people into the slave trade, but they also didn't necessarily see them as fully human. Um, Spain abolished slavery in 1811. You can see kind of some European states uh, follow along. Portugal, it, I think this was kind of interesting, in 1819 Portugal uh, abolished the slave trade north of the equator, so somehow there was a perception that south of the equator it was fine, but in the more civilized world it was not fine. Now of course in 1948 the Universal Declaration of Rights prohibits slavery in all its forms. We also have a formal UN treaty on the eradication of, of, of racism and slavery, but of course we also know this still continues to happen all over the world. In terms of US efforts, um, the US banned the slave trade in 1808. In 1862, on January 1st, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. But it's important not to romanticize the Emancipation Proclamation. This was really an order issued by Lincoln, partially because he believed in the importance of the freedom of the slaves, partially because the North needed more fighters to continue to fight the Civil War, and enfranchising black people meant more people who could fight for the North. Now eventually that was converted in 1865 and 1866 to the 13th and then the 14th and 15th Amendments, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of some of the complications that came up 
in the aftermath of the Civil War, which related to Reconstruction. So in general, we think, and um, I teach a lot about this in my Ethics of War class, in general, we think that you know the North won the Civil War and everything was fine, right? We kind of enfranchised blacks and everything went along just perfectly. But interestingly, after the Civil War, the leaders of the Southern government were not really punished as doing anything wrong, per se. In fact, Lincoln felt that it was very important to have this spirit of reconciliation between the North and the South. Um, and he enfranchised black people, and he set up what was called the Freedmen's Bureau to protect black people as they sought to kind of develop their own communities, develop businesses, develop farms, etc. The problem was there were a lot of unresolved tensions in the South that were taken out on freed black people. And it's actually really interesting, Professor Shannon Smith in the history department and I were talking about this because this is an area of her expertise. And lynching is not something we see until Reconstruction. And that is because why would you lynch a black person, lynching of black people, lynching of white people had actually happened before, but why would you lynch a black person because they were property? And so you still have these deeply ingrained racist views in the South that result in actually a pretty strong reign of terror. You're probably familiar with things like the Jim Crow laws, which seem horrible in racism and, and segregation. But what I think is not really understood was the way that, that terrorism and violence was used to kind of keep black communities in their place to deter them from fully participating in the political system, even though they really wanted to. And in the early days of Reconstruction, we do see a lot of black Americans elected to places in both local, state, and federal government. That kind of erodes over time, partially because of the rise of the KKK and white terrorism. So that takes us to Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Obviously, I'm kind of skipping broad swaths of history. But what's important is that Martin Luther King really saw a lot. He saw basically the fight for decolonialism. He saw the fight against Western imperialism is very similar to the fight for the end of racial discrimination in the United States. He saw these two fights kind of going in parallel. And one of the first times we hear Martin Luther King talk about um, kind of de linking the American Civil Rights Movement to decolonization was in 1956 when he gives this address kind of in the aftermath of the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, he talks about kind of this birth of a new age. And one of the, in, in your slides, you have these full text quotations that would look really ridiculous up here on these slides, but hopefully you can see the full context there. So one of the, one of the quotes that comes from the speech says, so with the coming of this time, an uprising started, protests started, and these people rose up against colonialism and imperialism. And as a result, 1.6 billion colored people in the world today, 1.3 billion are free. And so in a lot of ways, Martin Luther King drew inspiration from decolonization movements as opposed to inspiring them. Now he did, he traveled to India, uh, kind of in the vein of learning more about nonviolent struggle. He certainly did you know, visit and, and inspire a lot of people in other countries, but really I think the effect was, was much more important on him. Um, he also says in the speech that they have broken a loose from the evils of colonialism. And if we look back to see the old order of colonialism and imperialism thrown upon the seashores of the world, we see the new world of freedom and justice emerging on the horizon of the universe. So he really is kind of putting, giving people in the United States an understanding of kind of the movement forward, the persistence of decolonization movements, and trying to use that to inspire people here in the United States. Um, after the Montgomery bus boycott, though, I think Martin Luther King began, he was very hopeful, but he was also frustrated with the lack of progress. And he was also very distressed. He actually wrote a letter to President Eisenhower early in 1957 because he was concerned about um, kind of this, this white violence that was rising up 
to kind of challenge the gains that were making, being made by blacks in terms of equality. Um, so his congregation actually raised money to send a delegation to go to Ghana to see the inauguration, to see first the, 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 the kind of freeing of the Gold Coast, which is now known as Ghana, from colonialism, but also to see the inauguration of this new president, Kwame Nkrumah. And that, when, when he returned, he came back very, very energized. And he gave this speech, which is actually not a very widely written about speech, called Birth of a New Nation. I would love to play this speech for you, um, and it is available online. You have a hyperlink in your notes. The audio is not great. Um, so it's something where if you were listening to it with headphones on your laptop, you'd be able to understand it perfectly, but put it in a speaker in a, in a large room, and, and I'm a, I was afraid that you wouldn't be able to hear it. So I'm going to share some segments of that speech with you today, but I encourage you to uh, listen to it on your own. So after talking about kind of uh, Kwame Nkrumah's incredible history, so Kwame Nkrumah was raised in the Gold Coast, um, came to the United States, was educated in the United States, educated in Europe, but then felt this kind of need to go back home to help kind of free his peoples from colonial power. And so King then kind of says, Ghana has something to say to us. The oppressor never voluntarily gives up freedom to the oppressed. If Nkrumah and the people of the Gold Coast had not stood up persistently, revolting against the system, it would still be a colony of the British Empire. And what King is really trying to stress here is that, you know, um, he often talks about kind of the struggle will be long, the, more, the arc of the universe bend towards justice. This is kind of his reminder that you aren't going to, like freedom is not going to be easy because we've won in the success of the Montgomery bus boycott doesn't mean we're done and we can sit down, right? We need to keep moving towards racial equality. He also talks about how a nation or a people can break a loose from oppression without violence. Um, and this was very uh, reassuring to King because his position of nonviolence had been challenged by a lot of people and even Nkrumah himself kind of initially thought like I don't understand how we're going to be able to do this without violence but after studying with uh, Gandhi in India he could see that um, so he kind of started out seeing he could never see how they could get a loose from colonialism without armed revolt without armies and ammunition rising up but then he continued to study Gandhi, and he came to the position to, the, to see that the only way was through nonviolent positive action. We've got to revolt in such a way that after the revolt is over, we can live with people as brothers and sisters. And it's actually, there are a few kind of um, really interesting and touching accounts that King talks about in this speech. One is um, kind of at the end of the day, um, the delegation is walking back to you know, wherever they're staying, and they're listening to people in the street sing. They're singing freedom, um, but they don't speak English very well, so he's kind of like, it's kind of touching how it comes out. Like it's, it, they're saying English words, but, and it's clear that they know what it means. And he also kind of invokes, um, the kind of a phrase that becomes common in a, it's a Negro spiritual, uh, free at last, free at last, God Almighty, free at last. And he kind of evokes that as kind of that's what he's hearing from the Ghanaian people. He also talks about a dinner that they go to later after the Nkrumah inauguration where the Queen's representative to the Gold Coast, who now is just an invited guest to Nkrumah's inauguration, is dancing with Nkrumah and how kind of rem small but remarkable that is, that like here you have this kind of new upstart who basically overturned the colonial power dancing with this former colonial master, and how that kind of reflects his ideas about nonviolence, that you, you need to be able to kind of come away as living with people as brothers and sisters. Um, that optimism, I think, understandably, starts to become challenged for King. And part of that is because the long um, struggle that King is seeing, the, the, the resistance he's encountering, 
Um, and he writes about that, and, and his frustration is he can see this progress internationally, but he's not seeing that same progress domestically. And so, in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, we see a couple of very specific references to kind of the success of post-colonial movements and the lack of success in the United States. First, he talks about the nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed towards the goal of political independence, and we still creep at a horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. And so he's, he's frustrated that there's still this tremendous resistance. And I think um, uh, there was actually a reading on NPR on Monday by James Earl Jones of one of the other notable parts of this speech where he talks about being told to wait um, and how, how, how he can understand the, the well-meaning intentions of his white brothers, because of course it's, it's, it's Christian leaders who, are, who are, are condemning his actions in Birmingham, um, but that they don't understand what it means to be told to wait. Um, and that they've been waiting for 400 years um, and that they shouldn't have to wait to be treated as equals. Um, and he, he does try and frame this as though racial equality and racial justice are inevitable. He talks about oppressed people, oppressed people will not, cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. With his black brother in Africa, his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, he is moving towards that sense of cosmic urgency towards the promised land of racial justice. So still kind of trying to kind of keep hope alive, but say, you know, we need to actually, maybe we need to draw energy from these post-colonial movements, not just be trying to um, inspire them with our own actions. Um, there's a, a, a word in here that might seem kind of surprising, which is zeitgeist. And a lot of the scholarship around King's speeches, particularly at this time, see the, the concept of zeitgeist in, invoked quite a bit. And zeitgeist, um, as one of the authors explains, is the universe is under the control of a loving purpose, and that in the struggle for righteousness, we have cosmic companionship. So. Um, uh, King really kind of latched on to this idea of zeitgeist, and you do see it over and over again in several of his speeches. After um, kind of being imprisoned in Birmingham, King is awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize um, for his kind of efforts at racial equality. And so he travels to Oslo um, and addresses the Nobel audience, and he receives, you know, basically this Nobel Peace Prize uh, for Peace and Justice. And he talks about kind of what he is seeing, and again, he's kind of playing on this wave, uh, the, the end of, it's not just the end of the practice of colonialism, because we can see colonialism, we can see neo-colonialism still today, but kind of that the ideology of colonialism has become bankrupt. And so he talks about the deep rumbling of discontent that we hear as the thunder of disinherited masses rising from the dungeons of oppression to the bright hills of freedom. And then he talks about kind of like history for centuries was dominated by these colonial powers and that that era of colonialism is at an end. So kind of drawing a lot of inspiration again from post-colonial movements. He also introduces something that is very important that has been taken up by Reverend Will William Barber, who was interviewed on uh, the PBS NewsHour this week and the Poor People's Movement, which was kind of one of the last initiatives that, that King made before he was assassinated. So he starts that conversation about poverty here. A second evil which plagues the modern world is that of poverty. Like a monstrous octopus, it projects its nagging prehensile tentacles in lands and villages all over the world. And then I, I highlighted this point because I think it's really important, um, especially in light of the Oxfam report that has come out this week while 
people, the global elites are meeting in Davos that talks about kind of this growing problem of poverty and particularly inequality within states, not just between states. And so King says, the problem of poverty is not only seen in the class divisions between the highly developed industrial nations and the so-called underdeveloped nations, it is seen in the great economic gaps in the rich nations themselves. And just this week, in light of what's going on in Davos, you know, we're reminded of the UN Special Rapporteur who came to the United States to explore poverty in the South, um, and who found that there was tremendous poverty in the South, people who were living without basic infrastructure like running water and electricity, and how this is not really being addressed by the United States, and it's functionally a human rights issue. And so this, this conversation about equality is kind of putting, being put by MLK as part and parcel of this effort to move towards uh, global justice and human rights. Um, in one of the last speeches that King gave, at a time when he had really kind of fallen out of favor with a lot of white liberals, he kind of used his platform um, as someone who was credible on issues of racial justice to then turn his efforts towards opposing the Vietnam War. Um, and he really saw the interrelations of racism, poverty, and militarism. And one thing that really motivated him to speak out against Vietnam was, was what he saw it was doing to neighborhoods in the United States that a lot of the soldiers who were being sent to fight in Vietnam were from poor neighborhoods, they were persons of color, um, and they were really kind of really weakening a lot of these communities. Um, and so he talked about kind of a different approach to fighting communism from this kind of militaristic approach. And he said, instead of this kind of anti, negative anti-communism, our greatest defense against the communists is to take an offensive action in behalf of justice. Um, he, this is something that's actually really well explained in the recent Ken Burns documentary series on Vietnam. But Ho Chi Minh, um, and I don't want to portray him as like this romantic freedom fighter, but Ho Chi Minh had been advocating for freedom of the Vietnamese people from French domination for a long time. In fact, he petitioned Woodrow Wilson at the Treaty of Versailles um, to kind of recognize the freedom of Vietnam as part of this support of self-determination that was kind of um, a part of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Irish tried to get him to grant them independence too, and he was like, yeah, I'm not really interested in that. But so Ho Chi Minh, um, who was actually very uh, well educated in Europe, um, kind of had been trying to go through many legal, legal channels to fight for the independence of the Vietnamese people from French domination. Unfortunately, what ended up happening in Vietnam after World War II, and this is something that King talks about in the speech, is that the United States supported French reoccupation of Vietnam after the war, and then kind of supported their continued dominance until the French could no longer sustain their colony, and then the US took over, and that is kind of what we think of as the Vietnam War. Um, and I think that's really kind of, King kind of sees what's coming down the road. And he says, if we do not kind of move past this kind of violent anti-communist approach, um, if we do not resist it and instead try and move towards nonviolence, we will surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Um, and unfortunately, this is one of the last speeches he gives before he's assassinated. Um, if we think about Martin Luther King's um, legacy going on, um, obviously I'm, I'm very familiar with kind of um, how the, uh, so the SNCC movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, 
also traveled to different states that were decolonizing in Africa in the late 1960s and were very energized by what they saw. It's not like what was going on in these um, different African countries was some kind of pure romantic Lockean democracy, but that they were struggling, right? And they were continue the struggle and they were acting in, in terms of nonviolence. Now SNCC then later went on to create member, many members of the Congressional Black Caucus and also the non-governmental lobbying organization TransAfrica. And those two movements played a really important role in both starting student movements all over the United States to disinvest in South Africa, but also in overturning uh, President Reagan's policy of constructive engagement with South Africa, putting, finally with the US putting sanctions on South Africa, which played a really important role in kind of um, convincing South African leaders that they were on the wrong side of history and that apartheid needed to end. Um, we also know that the Congressional Black Caucus is very active in terms of uh, kind of promoting U.S. foreign policy interests in Africa, promoting economic development in Africa. So some other examples of that are things like the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, the U.S. hasn't always had great foreign policy endeavors in Africa, sometimes uh, well-intentioned but causing unexpected side consequences. And as just a shout out, there is a McCarthy Center event later today where um, one of our Johnny alums has spent a lot of time in South Sudan and he's kind of kind of described the, the democratic process that, that South Sudan went through in becoming a state and the challenges it encountered. Um, we also do have the World Conference Against Racism, which is constantly kind of pushing against racial discrimination that exists in all places of the world, particularly in South America, where the majority of African slaves ended up um, after kind of the, the tremendous movement of people that was the slave trade. And so there's a lot of really interesting racial discussions going on in places like Brazil as well. Um, before I kind of open it up to questions, I, I do want to say that one thing that I, I've kind of been thinking about this week as I've been putting together this presentation is that we do have kind of uprising and movements that are still occurring in a lot of these states of Africa where people haven't, despite rampant corruption, despite all kinds of problems with transparency and lack of trust of government, we still have people in Sudan in the Congo, in Nigeria, in Zimbabwe, who are kind of rising up to fight for this kind of ideal of freedom. Um, and so it's important to kind of remember if we look back at the United States and, and to use Martin Luther King's words, we went through our own wilderness in navigating towards democracy. And we're still going through that today even. Um, and so it's important not to judge other countries' navigation through this wilderness too harshly, and instead uh, to kind of understand what are the origins of these problems, what role have the United States and other Western powers played in kind of furthering and creating the structures that allow these problems to continue, and only then to kind of think about what role can we as individuals as states, as organizations play in kind of supporting people who are moving towards democracy. Uh, but we can't really start to have that conversation until we understand the structures and the influences that have been involved. And I think that's what Dr. King was, was trying to understand is see this incredible hope um, and kind of people, you know, really risking their lives. Uh, Nkrumah was in jail um, before eventually the British decided to kind of give up the colony of the Gold Coast. Uh, people who sacrificed their lives um, in the name of what is really an ideal of, of justice and of equality. Um, so I think it's important to kind of see how all of these things are intertangled. Uh, my, my selfish argument would be everything is political and everything is international relations. Um, so that's kind of what I have. I have so many more things I could have said, but I figured that's kind of overwhelming enough as it is. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have and also direct you to our resources if I can. So, um, and I did provide 
a lot of the resources here that I used in putting together the presentation and I sprinkled them all throughout the PowerPoint notes. So, yeah, questions, thoughts? I wish I knew, see I know some of your names, but that's not really fair. Julian, this is new to you, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Coming from Colombia, what do you think? It's really interesting. So in, uh, I can speak a little bit about Brazil and a little bit about Ecuador. So in the Brazilian constitution, they kind of declared themselves like this kind of multiracial, all happy state. And like they're like, everyone in Brazil is multiracial. So then everyone's the same. Um, but that's not really true. Like if you look at society and kind of what happens, and I use this in really fascinating video. So every year for Carnival, um, one of the big media outlets in Brazil chooses a Globozela. So this is kind of like this woman who is the embodiment of Carnival, right? And you know, it makes a lot of sense culturally. She's got a lot of glitter. And um, so they had a kind of an American Idol style com uh, competition for who should be the Globozela. And um, this woman who is incredibly beautiful but very, very dark skinned won this American Idol style competition. Well, once she won, the media outlet started to get tons of hateful emails. She started to get tons of hateful emails. And they basically replaced her within a week with a lighter skinned woman with no explanation. Um, and so there's also a really interesting so, so Brazil has now recognized that like, oh yeah, maybe race exists. So, but you have to apply to see if you're black enough basically to get access to some of the affirmative action uh, opportunities like job preferences and things like that. And you meet with a committee <laughs> who decides if you're black enough. And so um, I was listening, there's a podcast called Rough Translations and they, uh, first of all, this man had never really realized he was black before until he started applying for all these jobs and he couldn't get any and he didn't understand why. Um, and then he realized, okay, like maybe I'm black. Um, and it described the process of going through this committee meeting to decide if he's black enough to get affirmative action. So what I like about Rough Translations as a podcast series is they take these issues that are super relevant in the United States and then they look at them in other countries. Um, and so this one on um, Brazil and kind of their, their uh, kind of reckoning with race is, is really fascinating. So yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Ecuador also has the same thing where they kind of have this multicultural recognition in their constitution. Um, but in a lot of ways, um, the black community that lives on the coast has kind of been excluded and in some ways kind of Disney-fied. And so a lot of their practices are kind of lit in a limited way supported by the government, but only as long as they're kind of sanitized to be things that promote tourism and not really engaging with the difficult uh, racial and cultural conversations within Ecuador. So, yeah. Yeah. My colleague, uh, Professor Dos Santos would know a lot more about probably all of these things. Other questions or thoughts? Surprised? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times colonialism is talked about as this great sin, I mm -hmm. guess. And you mentioned the Berlin Conference and the dividing of these countries. Mm 
It's a very difficult question. Actually, it's something that Nkrumah, so Nkrumah of Ghana was a leader of kind of a pan-Africanist movement. And so at the time that decolonization was happening, there was discussion amongst the pan-Africanist movement of now that we have freedom, let's think about redrawing some of these borders to make them make more sense. So there was this very small period of time where this was considered. I think very naturally, leaders who had so long fought for freedom from their colonial masters did not want to give up territory and open up these sovereign borders to debate. Um, so I think it's always going to be, so because Nkrumah was really this, almost was arguing for something like, like um, kind of maybe an idealized version of the European Union, a federal system of cooperation between African states. Um, but people were very, uh, other leaders were very reluctant to give up sovereignty. And so I think unfortunately, um, that's kind of a legacy that's been baked in by colonialism that will be very difficult to address. And I think that's something I've been thinking a lot about too. So um, in one of my classes, I showed uh, Chimamanda Adichie's TED talk on the danger of a single story. And one really important thing she talks about in that TED talk is that where you start the story matters. Um, and a lot of times, the mainstream media in the United States starts the story of you know, African political instability with you know, corruption and um, lack of transparency and violence. And it doesn't start the conversation with this arbitrary creation of borders and also European colonial policies like in Rwanda that kind of took what were kind of benign cultural differences and escalated them and gave them power in people's minds, right? We just talked yesterday in one of my classes about the creation of race and why, why would we create a biological notion of race, which is totally false, right? Why would colonial powers create a notion of Hutu and Tutsi? Well, really it was a way to kind of empower the minority and disempower the majority. And we see that in a lot of places, both in Africa and in Asia. Um, and so it's important to think about where does the story start? Like a lot of times, ethnic, particularly ethnically tinged civil wars, like I was just reading the introduction of this book that's gonna be talked about later today between the Dinka and New Air in, in, in South Sudan. You know, it's like, oh, these people have been fighting for centuries. It's like, they haven't. Like these, these identities um, aren't necessarily meaningless, but they certainly never had the kind of political and cultural power um, before colonial masters came in and kind of gave them that power and, and constructed that power. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts? David, you look like you almost have a question. Oh, I was just curious, so I know this is based on kind of the US and MLK specifically, but how does this like post-colonial attitude work in like say Britain or France somewhere else that have a strong hand in Africa's creation? That's a really good question. Um, something that I probably should have thrown in. So what's really interesting in Europe right now is this discussion of the return of artifacts that were taken during colonial times. And so in fact, um, so part of this deals with the Elgin marbles. Um, Greece like wants the Elgin marbles back and the British Museum doesn't want to give them back. But there are museums, uh, particularly in Belgium, where they have all these artifacts that are basically ancient tribal artifacts from the Congo. And the Congo is like, we would, those are our artifacts that were stolen as part of colonial times and we would like them back. I think there is, more recognition in Europe of the challenges of colonialism, like that it was um, that it was exploitation. I think the difficulty, the reckoning that many people in Europe are having now is, what do we do, right? How do we do? We provide reparations. Um, do we return these artifacts? 
um, how do we kind of right these wrongs? And, that's, and, that, and it's a very active debate in terms of what should be done about that. But I think there is um, somewhat more recognition of, at least amongst policymakers, that this is a problem. There've been, it was funny, last semester, it was like every week something would come up where artifacts um, from different places that were colonized in Africa were be like museums in Europe were being closed and there were make, they were making arrangements or member uh, delegations from these countries were coming to Europe and saying we want these artifacts returned and so it's a very um, active debate there yeah does that answer your yeah. question yeah. yeah it's a fascinating topic the issue of cultural artifacts yeah and in who really is entitled to them? Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming again. Um, the slides are available. There's different handouts. And also, I see the notepad up here by Abby. If you would like to get an electronic version of the handouts, so you can click on some of the hyperlinks. Uh, please don't hesitate to let me know and I will email them to you. So thanks so much for coming today and I hope you have a great rest of your day.